as we turn now to an expert in Florida. Well, to look more at the Zika virus and its link to climate change, we turn now to our next guest. Dr. Amy Vitor is assistant professor of medicine at the University of Florida's Division of Infectious Diseases. She's joining us from Gainesville. Uh, welcome to Democracy Now!, Dr. Vitor. Could you talk about this virus and how serious it is compared to other mosquito-borne viruses? Yes, I'd be happy to. Good morning. Um, Zika virus is no doubt serious, um, just as we heard. Um, however, placed in the larger context of diseases around the world, especially mosquito-borne viruses that are equivalent, um, it needs to be remembered that, for example, dengue virus causes 100 to 400 million infections a year, with about 25,000 deaths. Um, chikungunya just blew through here, um, our, our continent, that is, and that led to about a million different cases. And also in India, another million and a half or so cases. So um, while Zika is quite important, um, I think stepping back, we realize that actually this is just a series of, um, of viral borne diseases that are now reaching our continent. So what do you think accounts for the fact that the World Health Organization has declared Zika a global health emergency? No doubt the microcephaly piece um, spurned that, and it's quite understandable. Um, with so many unknown factors, um, it makes sense to try to get ahead of the game and warn people, coordinate efforts. Um, so uh, with m the microcephaly, um, definitely the stakes have been raised, um, and, and fear has definitely been also raised amongst people who are affected. And therefore, I think it's quite reasonable to sound the alarm and ensure that research un be undertaken quickly and control measures, especially mosquito control measures, be undertaken quickly. Texas officials are reporting on the first case of Zika virus contracted here in the United States say it was sexually transmitted. Can you explain this, Dr. Vitor? Well, um, we don't understand the pathogenesis of this, I have to say. Um, it is the second time this has been reported, as far as I'm aware. Uh, the first time was actually in uh, Colorado, in a traveler who returned from West Africa. And so it was known that um, it can occur in the semen, probably, uh, the virus. Um, but how long it stays there and what it, uh, what it does in the genital urinary system, we really don't understand. Um, and nor do we understand the implications of this in terms of how much the virus can spread sexually, um, in addition to being mosquito-borne. Its relationship to climate change? Well, this is a very modeled picture. Um, the best data we have is really from the dengue climate change world. Um, there have been many models that have looked to uh, model the transmission of dengue under different climate change projections. And what seems to be the case is that there might be a, a slight increase in the range of the mosquito vector, Aedes aegypti, um, and also Aedes albopictus, uh, moving northward in the northern hemisphere and southward in the southern hemisphere. Now, I say modeled because there are many different effects of climate change and they're very local. Um, some areas might experience more rainfall and higher temperatures, whereas other places might experience the opposite. Also, um, some areas that are currently already warm may become too warm for the breeding of the mosquito. Um, so that certainly adds an element of complexity. And furthermore, we don't really understand how the mosquitoes are going to adapt. There's been an interesting study looking at the mosquito adaptation to changing, mos changing climate, and they're actually very flexible, very plastic, and they seem to be adapting to changing climate in Trinidad, for example, by seeking out new types of breeding sites. Um, and then furthermore, we're not sure how humans will react and how, how we will um, uh, change the way that we interact with the mosquito. In other words, we may actually increase our use of screens, um, change our, our mosquito control policies, and all this together adds for a very confusing picture. Um, and then, of course, for Zika specifically, we don't have any data. In another study you did with your colleagues, you examined the association between deforestation, mosquito vector factors, and the susceptibility of migrants compared with indigenous people in affected areas. Could you talk about the results of that research and how that might compare to the potential spread of the Zika virus? Uh, well, um, that study that you're referring to is ongoing, actually, um, and it, it's uh, in 
uh, relation to a virus called Eastern Equine Encephalitis virus in Panama, now actually renamed Madariaga virus. And it behaves quite differently, though, than Zika virus. But what we are starting to see um, following an outbreak in Panama of this disease is that there seem to be uh, household factors. So uh, lack of sanitation, for example, appear to be associated with increased risk for having been exposed to this virus. Um, similarly, um, having particular agricultural exposures seems to be um, uh, another risk factor for this particular virus. And what's interesting in this region is that there's been a massive uh, movement of people into the Darien province, which was formerly forested. Now vast swaths are, are deforested and, um, and they've become pasture land uh, for cow or cattle. And uh, how exactly this is going to play out, we don't understand yet. We're in the process of figuring that out. But I think it's very instructive to understand that West Nile virus, dengue virus, chikungunya, and Zika all actually probably originate from the Central African forests, and, and subsequent to human contact, um, as humans venture in and encroach upon that forest, it's possible that the virus and the mosquitoes ultimately adapt to then human cycles, and from there, it's able to spread worldwide. So um, there are, again, many unknowns in the sequence of events, but I, I think it's very prudent to, to take a closer look at the ecological effects um, of uh, um, e the ecological effects that uh, may precipitate further vector-borne illness. A Amy Vitor, we want to thank you for being with us, Assistant Professor of Medicine at University of Florida's Division of Infectious Disease. That does it for our broadcast.